Welcome to the sec third session of uh, SimScale and Onshape training on improving your product designs. My name is Pavel Sosnovsky and once again I will have uh, the pleasure of being your host today during this one hour session. A short agenda so that we know what we'll be talking about. First, we'll have a recap of previous two sessions. Well, we need to know where we, did we start and also introduce the, the ones who did not have the chance of being with, uh, with us during the two other sessions. After that, we'll talk a little bit about setting up a simple CFD case, so fluid dynamics case, and the let's say, challenges that a CAD designer and a person who, who works with CAD needs to overcome whenever doing so. After that, we'll have a short discussion about the concept of conjugated heat transfer, and we'll try to use thermal results for the two-step CHT, and then have an idea of how could we optimize our CAD design in order to improve the performance of the of the element that we're trying to make. We'll end up the session with a Q&A. Uh, at the same time, whenever you have questions during the, uh, the session, do not hesitate to ask them. If uh, it will be possible to, to do so, I'll try to answer them as we go. Uh, at the same time, do not get upset if it takes a little while uh, before I do that, since there's quite a lot of us and it might be difficult to, to handle all of the questions that appear. All right, let's recap the first two sessions. We had a look at the CAE loop where we introduced an extra subloop that involves using simulation in order to better our designs and then improve, improve them without building the prototypes, which highly reduces the cost and time required to ship our product. After that, we had a short talk about the SimScale approach where we provide you access with the numerical simulations online without any installation, without any hardware manufacturing and, and working on it, giving you direct possibility of working with uh, supercomputer clouds as we go. And all this through a simple web browser that's installed on your machine. Then we created our project. And of course, the best way of learning something is to have a real life example of what is it that we're trying to tackle. Uh, well, we imagined ourselves a case where our business partner required us to build a box or design a box for a piece of electronics. And during the first session, we had a look at the vibration analysis to estimate whether the design we have will be suitable or not for this kind of um, environment. During the last session, we investigated the thermal behavior of the board itself, and we tried to improve its thermal efficiency. And during today's session, we'll take a look at the per thermal performance of the box itself and the surroundings that uh, go inside the domain. What is it that uh, we are trying to solve? We'll be looking at the buoyancy-driven flows. In addition to the standard set of Navier-Stokes equations where we solve the continuity equation and mass equation, we'll add the energy, which later will be transformed into the temperature, or let's say we'll derive the relation for the temperature. And our assumption will be that the density changes caused by the temperature difference will drive buoyancy effects and in simple words will make our hot air go up and the cold air go down. I will not be getting into much details about the equations and the ways of doing that. Uh, at the same time, I would like to immediately drive our attention to additional considerations that we need to take whenever we deal with this kind of flow. Any kind of uh, simulation, any kind of numerical experiment that we are trying to perform creates a certain universe that is our geometry, which is floating in nothingness. 
it is our responsibility to make sure that all the boundaries of this small universe are set and defined. We know basically how to set up a CFD simulation where we deal with pressure velocity and then we will add temperature equation. Now the question would be how do we define the walls, the temperature behaving at the walls? One of the very tempting approaches is to simply decide hey I will have a fixed temperature on our walls. Let's say we will be simulating this heat, uh, heat box, heating box or heat uh, exchanger and we would say okay on the outside world since it is connected to air we'll just assume a fixed temperature. Not always this is the right way. Immediately we have to think what does it represent? What is a fixed temperature that uh, we set as a boundary. Basically it transfer, uh, transforms into a connection to a body that has an infinite heat capacity and will always keep the temperature at a fixed value. This is a very important observation especially whenever we are trying to see how does certain aspects of the flow change due to introduction of heat from other sources. In this particular case we are introducing, let's say in the example on the right side, we are introducing cold air or water into the flow and we would like to heat it up using the pipes inside where it is obvious we will set a fixed value temperature or a fixed heat flux that will be adding the energy into the flow. At the same time if we were to set a fixed temperature on the outside boundaries we would immediately be creating a situation when, where the boundaries are cooling the fluid and keeping it at a fixed value of uh, whatever we prescribe. This could definitely distort the view. So a first note to you whenever you're dealing with a buoyancy driven flows think what kind of boundaries do you want to have and what is it that such a boundary is representing. That was a little bit of the talk but in the end whenever you're setting up a simulation not only the mesh but also setting up and choosing the proper boundary conditions will ensure that we get the best possible results. So let's set up a heat transfer simulation on a CFD run and of course to do that we will use one of the projects that we were earlier working with and go immediately to SimScale platform. Before we set up the simulation obviously we need to create some kind of a mesh and have it done in on shape. Let's load the, the on ship box, uh, the box uh, case where I have it. Of course, this is the short project overview, and we'll go to the master <laughs> case where we designed our first box and created the first version of, uh, of the results. We had our PCB board, defined of several parts, created some radiators and using the, mm, these elements we, were man we managed to create a PCB board with the radiators which is used as right now as a base for our thermal simulations. Then during the first session we decided that our initial design of the box which had just straight openings would result in having vibrations to, mo to create a, a big deflections at the middle of those uh, parts. Thus we managed to div div make an improvement to the design adding an extra feature in the middle. Having this box ready we could create a part studio that uh, could later be exported uh, what did I say? We created an assembly that would later be transferred 
and to SimScale. So let's just take a look at the assembly and show it as a translucent view so that we know that inside we have all the elements as a standard design. And now having it done, this, is, this was done during the previous sessions, we are ready to import the design into SimScale. And it's as easy as using the import button inside your project. We've already tested that. To those of you who are new to our sessions, please just take a look. The thing is to decide which kind of project would you like to work with. Choose the assembly or part studio that is available and just click import. After a second, when the part is being compressed and uh, transferred between the servers, we will have it ready to work with on the SimScale platform. Obviously, depending on the size of the geometry and the amount of parts that we included there, it may take 10 seconds or, as you can see here, several. <laughs> we have our part ready to go. Um, I'll just give it some kind of an extra name or, in fact, simply, for the moment, we'll remove it since it's just a copy of what I uploaded a little earlier. Our first task whenever dealing with uh, numerical simulation and especially a CFD simulation is to create a mesh. Um, and the first challenge is that we are what we design uh, inside Onshape is the representation of the geometry that is consisting of solid bodies. For fluid flow simulations, what we want to work with is the inside of the body, the empty space, the fluid, air. So there are two ways of dealing with this, the old-fashioned way, which would require us to simply perform a Boolean operation on the whole set. We would create a box body and simply subtract all the elements that are there, creating hollow spaces and thus getting us one chunk that would be the, the simulation body, the simulation space. Or we can use the uh, Snappy Hacks simulation tool um, that, that allows you to perform meshing operations for external flows or in this case a manual Snappy Hacks setup which gives us a mesh that is basically an extract of the volume of the case. So let's just load one of the meshes that I created. In fact, whenever we are trying to, uh, whenever we are trying to, to create a mesh, uh, you, what you get is something that I would like to, uh, I like to um, think of as if we would put molten metal into the domain and simply destroy everything else, leaving it as hollow spaces. If I would just change the viewer type to surfaces and hide the surfaces, you will notice that all these parts are here, but in fact, they are hollow. We'll do one more thing. We'll try to make a clip through this mesh, making it zero, one, and let's just move this a little bit up. And take a look what's happening. And while the operation is being uh, performed, and we are making the mesh clip, I see that we have a question. When you import from Onchip, you say Part Studio. Is it uh, the file brought is the file brought from the cloud or local storage? Uh, whenever you're importing using the button directly from Onshape, it's being taken from the cloud and directly put into the cloud. So you have, oh, so this, this mesh has some trouble being clipped. 
But basically what we would get is the, mm, the look of the hollow space inside uh, of, of the element. Okay, now a little more on, on the meshing and the ways to create a, a good CFD mesh. You can definitely go and see our tutorials on the, in the help section of SimScale and also take a look at the documentation where we describe the Snappy Hex Mesh, a tool which is a pretty powerful a measure that allows to create hexahedral element domains. But in order to keep the whole presentation short and consistent, we'll take a look at what happens when we are ready to prepare a simulation itself and start running it. Okay, so once again, we, are, we will be creating a CFD simulation and for this moment it's just loading it what i will do is i will create a template a new simulation fresh choose fluid dynamics and right now we have the choice of multiple types of analysis the great thing with the uh, simscale is that you have access to all the simulation types nothing is hidden uh, and you can perform your calculations, your analysis, just for free, as, as long as you're keeping it uh, available for the public and you share your knowledge with the community. Today, we'll be doing a natural convective heat transfer analysis. We'll keep the simulation laminar and we'll say, set it to steady state. If you take a look, we have the simulation number 19. I will save the changes and two things will happen. First of all, all your data is being stored in the cloud so that whenever you log off, your computer switches off, everything will be back as soon as you get to a PC, let's say in Brazil or in China after a long flight, and you're ready to continue your work as uh, from the moment where you left it. And the second thing that happened is on the left side, in the tree view, we have a created template for the simulation. Now we'll use the top to bottom simple approach that will allow, allow you to set up the simulation in no time. We'll choose one of the meshes that was created and you can see that in my master file uh, for this uh, session, I have multiple of them. There is basically no limit. On, uh, except for space but whenever you have too much data you can download the results and free um, you get access to 500 gigabytes on SimScale I think it's more than enough to to keep very demanding uh, simulations on them after choosing the domain we'll have to start setting up the simulation first we would group the faces of the mesh into sets and give them some kind of a name. In this particular case, I did it already just to have, uh, have them done. So let's just show a group of box faces. We'll hide them. The side opening, which are the faces in front. This will be the inlet and outlet from our box. Let's select it and hide it and then separate elements for the PCB board or the plastic part at least of the PCB board and each of the components like the power supply like some capacitors some other electronic components And of course, our processor, the radiator above it, and so on and so forth. This is a set that you do uh, earlier uh, or after your mesh is created. You do it once for each mesh. This way, you can simply and fast uh, get a fast access to all those setups. And there is another question: Is it possible to connect uh, the cloud data? 
on SimScale to your local computer and sync them together, similar like a Google Drive. Now, all the things that you're doing with SimScale are online, and all the setups, all the work, every operation that you do is done in the cloud. At the same time, after you get the results, you can download them and keep them on your computer for further post-processing, and we will be doing just that later today in order to do some advanced uh, modelization. So just please keep patient, and we'll get to the point. Okay, we grouped our faces. Now we'll go down step by step, not missing any part. And this is, let's say, one of the things that sometimes is being forgotten for people who set up um, simulations, that is, select the direction where the gravity is pointing. It seems so obvious and so natural to do that <laughs> we often do not uh, remember to, to select the direction of gravity, but at the same time, for any kind of buoyant flow, it is crucial to have the direction of uh, gravity set up. At the same time, thanks to this flexibility, you, have, uh, you, you can change the direction on which the box is being positioned. If I would like to have it screwed up to the domain in this way, the only thing I have to do is change the direction of gravity. And of course, keep giving a value. On our original design, we wanted to have the box screwed to some kind of vibrating machine in, uh, in the direction uh, of y-axis. So to do that and to have the gravity pointing downwards, we'll just keep it, uh, keep its y value to the whole direction. Now let's select the material. To those of you who participated in the previous sessions, you'll notice definitely a certain pattern. The way that we are doing things, even though we switch to a fluid dynamic simulation, we are using the same steps or very similar steps to select the material, assign it to the domain. We chose a simple uh, element like air from the, from the mat small material library. At the same time, we have the full flexibility of choosing different parameters. If we were to use some kind of heavier material, it's, uh, it's possible to do or choose different dynamic viscosity. It's all at our disposal. After that, we'll start with the initial conditions. Uh, in this case, we have to deal with real pressures, velocities, and initial temperature. I remember that the simulation we set up for our PCB board was put at 273 degrees. It's zero Celsius, but still, uh, we'll just keep the data consistent. So we'll set up the initial condition for 273 degrees Kelvin and start setting up the boundary conditions. We'll add the first one that will be the outlets or openings, let's call them like this, because also air will be able to get in and out. In order to do that, uh, there are two ways of setting up boundary conditions on SIM scale. You can either use a predefined boundary condition type, like pressure inlets, pressure outlets, symmetry, and so on and so forth. At the same time, right now, we have to go for a little more advanced setup, where we choose custom boundary condition that, uh, is, that gives you full flexibility and full responsibility of choosing the right type for velocity, pressure, temperature, and other parameters that are required. In this case, for velocity, since we would like to have the possibility of the flow going in and out, we'll choose pressure inlet outlet velocity. And for pressure, we'll choose the total pressure boundary condition, giving the atmospheric pressure outside. For temperature, we'll use the inlet outlet boundary condition, which works the following way. If the flow leaves the domain, it is just you working as an outlet. It will just take the energy away. If it is an inlet, it will be providing a certain temperature, fixed temperature, into the domain. And we'll use the same 
value as for the initial conditions. For the dynamic viscosity, in this case, we can set a gradient to zero. Or we could choose some kind of a value, but in this case, it's not, uh, not necessary. And we'll assign this boundary condition to the side opening that is the face which I highlighted right now. We click Save, and we have our first boundary condition set. All right, clicking on boundary conditions, we're, uh, we can fast add next ones, such as adiabatic walls. And of course, I need uh, typing lessons. <laughs> this time, we'll use the predefined wall boundary condition. We don't have to deal with uh, pressure, for example the extra fields that are not necessary or are, are explicitly selected so that they work and increase at the time that we are dealing with the case. And now we would like to, with the adiabatic walls, we would like to set up the values for the outside box so that it doesn't cool uh, the domain and at the same time it will allow the, the exchange of heat to happen only through the inlet and outlet plus through the heating elements that are present in the domain. In order to do that, we'll change the temperature type from fixed value to a setting uh, to set gradient to zero. This will correspond to the situation where we have an adiabatic boundary condition. And to this, we'll set to the box walls, we'll give it to the PCB board, and the power supply, since they are made of plastic and basically they cannot have the heat transferred. So these are the, the elements that will be having the adiabatic boundary conditions. And now it will be a job to set up the temperature conditions for other elements. Let's create, uh, let's create some kind of a boundary condition, let's say for the processor. This time it will be once more a wall condition. And now the question is, what kind of temperature should we use on the processor? In order to do that, we'll go back to the results we obtained from the previous simulations. That is uh, the ones that were done last time. And we'll simply have a, an evaluation of the results with the with the temperature values that we obtained. So that we'll just jump to the post processor, choose the simulation that we did for the PCB board with radiators. Of course, the data needs to load. There we go. All right, and we have our case rendered on my local machine. Now we can choose what would you like to color it with. Let's go with the temperature. Once more, the, the, the data needs to be present and rendered. And of course, we need a scale in order to, to understand what kind of values are present. It's not just a colorful picture, but some kind of meaningful result. So there is the scale. And right now, I would take my notebook and 
based on the values that are present here or after downloading the data and making probes on the surfaces, I would just estimate the average temperature of each element. In this case, we would say that, well, on the processor, we have around 300 degrees, 295, 93, um, whereas the radiator above it, it's definitely 295. The, the small chip goes around 280, 85. 86 whereas all the PCB board is uh, at the 273 which means that it is just keeping the temperature that we set as a default as the relative default one obviously this is a very crude approximation of the temperature for each element at the same time it's the fastest way to get the results so that Whenever you make this kind of analysis, it, it might be good to perform this kind of simple step before you jump to more advanced ones that can have trouble with uh, providing you with the results, especially for very big cases. So we would go back to our simulation designer, or, well, the first thing would be to create some kind of a screenshot, download it, and or print it for ourselves and use it to easily set up the case say having it on the second screen so that we could set up the proper values for the for example for the processor we could go with a fixed value temperature of 299 oh 299 degrees on the power not not the power the processor of course We'll not be setting up all the boundary conditions. We'll just take a look at the, the ones that I did earlier on another simulation. Exactly as I described, we'll have the adiabatic walls, the open boundary. In this particular case, we're also dealing with a turbulence model, which introduces some extra fields, but uh, that's not a big tr problem for us. We have fixed value temperature for resistors, chips, radiators. The only thing that changes is the, the value of the temperature that we set for the simulation. After that, we jump to numerics. There is not much to be done here. At the same, on the next step will be to set up the simulation controls. A very important thing is to select a proper end time value. This will be the approximation of the results that we'll obtain during the simulation. Since we are dealing with a steady state simulation, every step or the time itself does not exist. Every step is just another approximation of the solution. What we want to get is to a situation where all the equations balance each other and we get to what is called basically the steady state. And this may happen after several hundred, hopefully, or several thousand steps. Uh, I personally like to keep the time step length to one for steady state simulations for easy count on how many of them just passed. This is a, I selected a very short simulation for demonstration purposes. Uh, I believe that for this simulation, we would need to have at least several thousand um, time steps in order to get to the convert, fully converged solution. And not surprisingly, we're not saving anything in between. Only the last step is interesting, since it is the closest approximation of the final result that we are looking for. Now, sometimes I like to keep it and save one extra point at, in the middle of the, of the run in order to be able to take a look at what's going on over there. But it's not necessary for such a small one. Then we choose the number of computing cores. With SimScale, you have immediate access to supercomputing power of the clusters. You can run any number of uh, simulations that involve multiple cores, and you have the possibility of choosing from one to 32 cores that will per be used for the particular task. At the same time, you have the possibility of setting up the maximum runtime for your simulation, since you have a limited amount of core hours as a free user or even a professional user. So 
keep it safe, at the same time giving, giving a reasonable place to play around. This particular simulation that I created took 48 minutes to simulate. It, it has quite a lot of data, but I saved a bit of uh, results in the meantime. So let's just scroll away the windows and take a look at the initial results that we got from the box 1.1 CFD simulation. In this case, we have a pretty interesting field and the recirculation pattern inside a domain with the reference temperature being 273 kelvins and the average temperature after the simulation increasing only 4.3, 4 4.7 uh, degrees. That was a little puzzling to me, and I think that this simulation would require a lot, a little longer to converge, and also a proper setup for the boundary conditions, since the inlet and outlets are very close to the main recirculation domain. For any kind of flow simulation, always try to make sure that the boundary you're choosing is uh, as uniform as possible, so that there, it, there is no vortex that you can cut. In this case, well, this was just an initial test, so we, we chose this kind of setup. But then we could imagine extending our domain to the outside, giving some kind of a bulk domain on the other side of the box, where the flow could do whatever it wants, but it's not important for us. At the same time, this would extend the possibility of, correct, of correcting the results inside the box itself. All right, and just to visualize some results from this particular domain, we'll take a look at uh, the simulation and some images. These are the cuts through the domain showing the magnitude of velocity. We notice that there is a big pattern and some kind of huge velocity flow close to the radiators. At the same time, the surprising thing is that these radiators did not have a very high, velo high temperature. This would indicate to me that either the mesh has some trouble over there or the simulation still did not converge to the final result. And having this seen, we can take a look at the temperature profiles. As we expected, the temperature is highest close to our PCB board and it is accumulating on the top part of the domain. All right, so what would be the choice of a modification that we could do in order to improve the design that we have. Well, for me, the first thing that I thought would, was to make some holes on the top. Let's remove uh, the space over there, make an opening, and allow the, the, the hot air to move away from, from the domain. In order to do that, obviously, I jumped to on shape and prepared the design of uh, the pot. First thing would be to get a part studio that uh, resol resembles our second box. Let's just take a look at how, it, how was it done. And let's use the great rollback option of uh, on shape that allows us to, to have this view from part, from one element to another. In this case, I simply created a copy of the same box that we had made previously. Copy-paste or a duplicate of, uh, of the Part Studio 1.1. And then added a simple sketch on the top, choosing the proper heights and in order to match the exact position of the opening with the um, with the existing holes, I used this uh, the option of uh, 
intersection tool that allowed you to, to take this line and project it or project a single point on this line onto the sketch plane. And then it was just selecting the proper distances and some chamfers. Nothing spectacular, honestly <laughs> speaking. Ending up with uh, extrude going inside. And anytime I take a look at this kind of uh, designs and having uh, the possibility of working even with simple extrudes, cuts, I'm amazed by the possibilities of Onshape and how fast is it to create this kind of uh, geometries and modifications. We have the box ready. We made the modification. It took us how much? Five, ten minutes. We can choose to create the second assembly where we would take and derive the PCB board with the radiators, derive or insert the part from, from the, of the second box and use two mate connectors in order to position them with properly with respect to one another. Now, having the design ready and on shape, we can go to SimScale and once more use the option of importing the data directly from the cloud. So we'll just go open the file, find the the assembly that we're interested in, click import. I will not do that uh, since, well, it's, it's not necessary because I did it up beforehand. At the same time, just to address the question we had earlier, can you upload the designs uh, from your local drive? Yes, you can. Uh, one of the possibilities is that you would just right click on your assembly and export it to a step file and download the file. If you have some desire to, to play with some extra tool to, to process the design or so, or so on, you can do that. And later, on SimScale, you just use the second button, just upload your CAD or mesh. In this case, it would be a geometry. We support STEP, IGS, BREP, and STL files for fluid flow dynamics. So we would just select step, chose the file that we want to play with, and start uploading. But hey, why to have an extra step when you can take it directly from Onshape and work online all the time? All right, so let's take a look at our domain. We have the box and a PCB board looking exactly the same. The only change are the openings on the top. And we're ready to create a second mesh. Two million. Oh. It's a really big one. Oh yes, this is the, the bigger one. <laughs> I shouldn't have selected it. Um, let's go to the smaller mesh that had uh, around two million elements. In fact, for your first simulations on particular cases, I highly encourage you to go with the meshes that have around two to three million elements max. This will allow you to have a fast simulation or a relatively fast simulation, keeping the accuracy good enough to be able to analyze something and uh, decide should I make extra refinements or not. Once more, we performed a volume extract of the whole domain, leaving all the elements like the box, which you can imagine that is around this, uh, this part, and the inside parts like the PCB board, the capacitors, completely hollow. The only thing that is really meshed is the domain, the air inside. Okay, we can go and set up the second simulation. I will not go through the whole setup because it's exactly the same with the one difference that we have to add an extra boundary condition for the top
for the top boundary where we have the opening that can take the air away from the domain. So not going into details, first we select, the, we grouped the faces together, we chose the direction of gravity, selected the material, assigned the proper initial conditions, keeping close attention to temperature since we had a, a little odd choice of the temperature for the uh, PCB board analysis, adding extra boundary conditions such as adiabatic walls to everything except the PCB board. If I hide the selection now, we'll see that only the rest of the parts remain. Choosing the temperatures as the ones that we discussed earlier from the and obtained from the previous results and just hiding, uh, just assigning the values to, to the domains. You will notice one, one interesting thing that I'm doing. Every time I have a boundary condition and I created it, I will hide the selection. This way, on the screen, the only thing left is the are the faces that are not assigned and they do not have the boundary condition selected. This way and this process will make, sure, will make you sure that you did a good job and had all the boundary conditions properly set. So just adding one by one, hiding and checking if the values that we selected for temperature for all the other parameters are the correct ones. So we have the, the pre-last the processor, select assigned, hide selection, processor and the radiator, select assigned, hide selection, and we're left with just one face. That is the top opening, the new thing that we had to add, and we'll just use another pressure inlet outlet boundary condition. Well, this was not exactly the one that I chose for the for one of the results, but uh, hey, that's how we set it up. And we're ready to, to go with the simulation. This one was a little uh, running for a little longer, 900 steps. Still, I think it did not uh, perfectly converge, but uh, we can try to see the results and understand something from what we got. In this particular case, we got a very interesting result. Oh, before we go, there is another question. Uh, could I explain how did I decide about the mesh size for this particular example? Uh, we're getting uh, pretty short on time. Let's leave this question for the uh, Q&A session and I will go back to it right after that, uh, right at the spot, okay? Thank you for your patience. So the, the difference, uh, the, the thing that we found out is that the reference temperature got much higher with respect to the results we, we've got earlier, that is four degrees. And this was because we had a big recirculation zone and a flow that was moving much faster and transferring heat inside the domain much, uh, in a much more vivid way. Um, this is due to the fact that we have open boundaries and would drive me to believe that, hey, most likely there was something not properly set with the boundary conditions, so that maybe this we should extend the domain, creating a little bit of this empty space on the outsides of the box, and uh, this way make sure that uh, we are really doing something that makes sense. So there is still future developments possible. Now, the question would be, how can we take uh, the results from the previous, re previous data and use them in order to visualize directly the values and, and that we got from the PCB board, not just approximating them by, by looking at a picture? From, from the previous results. In order to do that, first thing we would need to do is go to our thermal simulation that we performed earlier, 
find out the results, and download them. I'll not be doing that because it's already been done. With the results downloaded, you can start post-processing them using offline tools such as Paraview. So let's just take a look at Paraview itself. This is an offline post-processing tool provided by Kiteware, an open source thing. And we are ready to open the case. After downloading the case, so here I have the, the thermal simulation data. It's using the VTM format. It's just as easy as selecting and applying the thing. And at the same time, there's another question about the, the tolerances and the stop conditions. Uh, yes, we do that. I'll again go back to this question after we, we move uh, with the section about the CHD and direct data applications. So what we have here are the results of the whole domain, including everything that is inside the boxes. So the first thing we would like to do is wa use one of the filters, one of the many filters that Paraview gives us access to. In fact, I would like to extract surface just to get the data on the outside. And then having the data the, the surface extracted, I can take a look at the spreadsheet view, at the point data, choose the fields that are interesting to me. Ooh. The point ID is not important, but what I want to know is the value of the position, so the point, and the temperature at this particular point. What we see here is just a representation of the single element but if we were to go and save data, we would get the gathered information from every face and every point that is on the surface of this domain, which can be later used to upload as a boundary condition for SimScale. So the only problem that we got is that our domain consisted of 352 faces, and each one of them got a separate file from, uh, from Paraview. I'm sure that there are special scripts that allow you to, to write everything into one file. I did not find it beforehand, but then I have some friends who, who use Linux, and me, myself, I really like it. With a single line looking something like this, you are able to merge all those CSV files into one, Basically, this was the line that I used and got a file merge CSV, which instead of being 352 separate files was just a single file. I'll just show you, this is the, the merge file. Just to give you an incentive to, to maybe try out Ubuntu, <laughs> the open source tools that uh, some of us dread so much. At the same time, they are really friendly and allow you to do a lot of powerful things. So we have all this information ready and merged. How to prepare a simulation that requires a tabular input? We have all the information gathered in one file. Now we would like to set up and use it as a boundary condition for SimScale. Let's have a look at the example of such a simulation done on one of the boxes. In order to set such a simulation, we'll need just three boundary conditions. First, the ones that will define the side openings of the domain. Second, that will define the adiabatic walls. Let's hide them also. And the last one is the one that 
consists of all the all the other parts that will be interpolated with the data. So let's go to the pre-calc, PCB values. My poor computer is starting to, to feel the load of uh, too, clicking too many things at once. And keeping all the data, I'll try to clear up some memory. There we go. This time we chose a wall condition as we did. The original setting for the temperature was a value or function where we set up the fixed value condition for every other boundary. We'll just change the input type to a file upload. After that, we'll choose what kind of domains should be, uh, what kind of parameters should be active. You can define just X, Y, or Z, or all of them uh, independently. And finally, you can upload the, the CSV file to your computer, from, from your computer. So it's a pretty big one in this particular case. Uh, since it consists a lot of data, we could try to thin it up just to make the simulation run a little faster. And then we just assign it to the whole boundary. The values of the temperature will be interpolated into the cell centers and used for the whole simulation. So there is another question. I did not notice the comparison of the uh, Yes, so there is a. This is a very good question when it comes to the quality of the results. Uh, that uh, there is uh, the comparison of the before and after temperature changes. Let's let's go and uh, have a look at them once more. A little bit. So this is the situation where we have the, the let's say the main uh, area that I wanted to focus for this really simple particularly not very complicated the, um, simulation is that without the vents, the temperature difference, the, the average temperature inside the, the whole box ended up at 277.7 Kelvin, whereas after adding the vent, it got much higher, 282.1 Kelvin. This drives our attention that, well, the assumption is uh, maybe wrong or there is some other physics happening inside the, the whole box that needs to, be, uh, needs to be addressed. So further analysis would be required. And in fact, I highly encourage you to find out this simulation. It, is, it will be available after this session as a public project you just type on SimScale on Shape Webinar 3, and you'll find it. You can just start running your own simulations and try to figure out what kind of improvements would be better for this particular design, and what was the fa what was the reason why we have this strange strange uh, effect on the temperature. All right. Now, in order to, to visualize all these results and how does the simulation like this look like, it might be a little challenging. So for this reason, I prepared a little smaller case um, that, will be much, that will be suiting this kind of uh, presentation that we are having today. In order to do that, let me just find the simulation itself. quick count change. I'll just show you what's happening. Basically, I have quite a lot of uh, projects <laughs> in my account, which makes it a little challenging to 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 load all the, the things that are going on. 
let's take a look at this simpler example. It's again a public project which you can look for. It's called decoupled CHT simulation where we have a simple box or two boxes. This is also created on Onshape. We made us a fast simulation of this little element. Oh, this is just the we meshed everything, but uh, we, we got the results from the heat transfer analysis simulation. Let's take a look at the post processor. Solid results. The only thing that we are interested in are the results on the on the bound on the box boxes. Later we will extract from using Paraview the same technique that uh, that I demonstrated to you earlier. So we have the temperature field. And if we were to open the results, We could extract, so so there we there we have the results. What we do after we extract surfaces, and save data. We'll get a file containing the information about the surface uh, values. And with this, we can go to SimScale platform. Whoa, let's just close it. And use as a simulation setup for, for the flow. So once more, we'll have the fixed file temperature where we uploaded a file with all the values and positions x, y, and z of the um, of the temperature setup, and we get some pretty nice simulation results. As soon as they load. Oh, this is a reference file. If we were to take a look, for example, at the temperature, obviously nothing is seen here, but if we have a nice slice through the domain in the y direction, move it a little closer. Even closer. and color the slice with the temperature at the last time step we will see a pretty interesting flow profile developing all right so what did we obtain uh, basically we had the possibility of using the results from one kind of simulation that is the thermal analysis on a particular element and apply them to a CFD simulation that uh, later could produce some interesting results. And in fact, not even using a simpler CFD simulation, we could perform and make engineering decisions that could involve big changes in the geometries, which was done basically pretty fast and pretty accurate.
With the benefits coming from the possibility of using SimScale, once more, we, I will not be getting into the, poss the working in the cloud and the uh, designs that you get, the, develop the possibilities of developing your products faster or paying just for what you use. We are all well aware that this is the future and the possibility of uh, working with this kind of problems and uh, solving them in a collaborative way with the new tools that emerge gives us the benefit of being the front runners when it comes to developing our products. All right, so today we covered a little bit of computational fluid dynamics and the fast way of integrating it with Onshape so that all our design can be done online. Earlier we talked a bit about structural mechanics and thermodynamics. There is much more to be covered with the platform and with the integration with Onshape so that I highly encourage all of you to join and start working on your designs, start testing them and performing numerical experiments that will drive your products and make them better and more efficient. All right, now we are a little bit over time. I really thank you for sticking up with, sticking here. Uh, let's go back to the questions that were posted a little earlier. So the first question will be, can you please explain how did you decide about the mesh size for this particular example? That's a very good question. And in fact, choice of the mesh is a very, very important choice that we are making any time we are dealing with a numerical simulation. I just need to switch to my other account and go back to the example we were working with. Most important thing when coming to the mesh is uh, at the very first of your simulation is, to, is the speed. So first, you want to have a good representation of the domain you're working with. All the features captured and certain amount of refinements done uh, close to the elements that are of interest. Then, um, and this is done for the first run. So in this particular case, I decided to go with two million elements, uh, which is a, not an overwhelming amount of cells. At the same time, it gives you a pretty decent representation of the domain. Then, for any kind of numerical simulation when you're dealing with a very advanced flow, you can address the mesh quality using some post-processing tools we have them available on the, in the post processor. You could just jump here, choose the mesh that you want to work with, load it, and apply a mesh quality filter and check the quality of the domain. Now, the size of the elements, mm, when it comes to the amount of cells that you want to have, for any kind of inlet, you need at least several cells that will capture the, the flow features. The coarser the mesh, the less features of the flow you will have. It's basically for any control volume, for any element inside this, uh, this domain, you will have a prescribed fixed velocity, fixed temperature, and so on. This is the resolution of the result. The more cells you have, the more accurate and more smooth the results is. On the other hand, the more elements you have, the more expensive is the simulation. Two million cell uh, geometries can run pretty fast. I mean, you get the CFD results, some complex CFD results within one or two hours running on multiple processor machines. If you were to go with a mesh that is ha have tens of millions of elements, these are enormous ones and most likely should be used only for very advanced problems. On the other hand, if you go to, with a mesh that is too coarse, you will lose quality of your results and you will not be able to represent the features of the flow. So it's, it's a balance that comes from a little bit from experience, but basically from trying to capture properly all the features and have the good representation of, uh, of the domain itself. I hope this answers your question. Let's go to the second one. Under what circumstances did you run into 
divergency in the numerical calculations. Do you have any choice on tolerance or stop conditions? So let's take a look at this. In fact, you get full control on the fluid flow analysis uh, simulations and uh, solvers that are working. This all is uh, selected in the numerics section of the simulation setup. Over here, you can play around with the relaxation factors, which will tell you how fast do you approach the solution. You can give the proper tolerances to each of the solvers separately, choosing the relative tolerance for the step-to-step uh, step step convergence and the absolute tolerance that, tolerance that needs to be reached. And finally, when you want to know if you reach the convergence, you have the residual controls which said this is the absolute tolerance of the whole field. If each of the fields would reach this initial um, initial residual value, we would stop the simulation and consider that we got the results. For more on uh, how to set up these uh, parameters, such as the relaxation factors, and how to improve the way you're approaching the simulation results, I can direct you to our documentation and a documentation of open foam, which is used as a numerical solver for these calculations. Okay, there's another a question. Is there anything equivalent to Shannon sampling rate for images that you can use to help uh, select the necessary discretization for 3D model or, or meshing? Uh, Right now, this feature is not available on SimScale. Basically, what you do in order to, to address the quality of the mesh, so let's, let's take a look at the example like this. What you can do is apply a mesh quality filter, and after it appears, we are having a pretty heavy load on my computer. You can choose what kind of parameters would you like to have as the, the mesh quality selection. There's quite a lot of them. So you could inspect the Jacobian of the uh, surface elements. You could expect their um, scale the Jacobians or, or aspect ratio, aspect ratios, and so on and so forth. These are standard settings for one of the filters, the mesh quality filter that's available in Paraview. And that's the way that we, are, this is the first way we are using to, to evaluate the quality of the mesh. The second way, obviously, is the mesh independence study that you can perform yourself to run your simulation on two different meshes, one finer than the other, and comparing the results. Or uh, the last tool that, uh, that you're left with uh, is the possibility of calculating Y plus parameters. This is especially important for turbulent flows. This is done under result control items where you can add a surface data item called dimensionless wall distance calculation. During the simulation time, based on the velocities and the shear flow velocity close to the wall, we'll be calculating the Y plus and this way inspecting if we have fine enough mesh close to the boundaries. So these are the tools that are available right now on the platform. And after you have the mesh and after you download it, you can use other post-processing techniques to address the quality. And of course, you're always left with the log, uh, where at the very end, you have the information about the quality elements, how many faces we have with certain uh, skewness, certain uh, twist, and so on and so forth, which also can be controlled when you create the mesh itself. This is all a feature of Snappy Hex Mesh. All right, I hope this answers your question, or at least gets close to it. Well, we're a quarter after time. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and for joining SimScale uh, uh, and Onshape training on how to improve your designs. Now my phone will switch on because I clicked on the wrong icon. Sorry about that. I'd like to thank you uh, for participating during this SimScale training and wish you a great evening. Hope to see you on the platform.
please ignore this little uh, <laughs> element that shows always in the wrong uh, the wrong moment. Um, if you have any additional questions or would like to get engaged with the SimScale community, I encourage you to join our SimScale forum and post the questions over there. Obviously, there are there's also the Onship forum, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on the platform. Thank you very much. Pavel Sosnowski, signing out. Bye-bye.